This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to every single one of you, including Kelly Cook, Scott Hepburn, Bjorn Andre, and our new patrons helping us to get to our patron goal, Michelle, Scott, Wauga, and Mark. On this episode of Daily Tech News Show, the metaverse may have started in Indonesia. They got real-life metahumans down there. Plus, EA makes moves away from being a video game company. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 21st, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio 7 Lamps, I'm Sarah Lane. From Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And the show's producer, Roger Chen. Let's get right into the quick hits. As part of the continuing protests around Reddit's API pricing changes, some subreddit moderation moderators have switched their communities to NSFW, aka not safe for work. This means that Reddit doesn't display ads on these communities. Now, as a result, Reddit started suspending some of these mods with spokesperson Tim Rothschmidt saying moderators incorrectly marking a community as NSFW is a violation of both our content policy and moderator code of conduct. Mods for the mildly interesting subreddit report that their team has been subsequently reinstated. Maybe they posted some not safe for work content. Like, no, see, it's correct. Look it's at these mildly butts. interesting. Yeah. Uh, ByteDance owned TikTok is testing a new shopping feature in the UK called Trendy Beat offering a selection of items that are popular in TikTok videos. The Financial Times reports these items are sold by another ByteDance-owned company, with ByteDance reportedly taking all the revenue from the sales, but keeps it all in the family. Uh, this is different from TikTok Shop, which you may have come across. That allows third parties to sell items, with TikTok taking a commission on the sales. TikTok Shop has proven popular in some Southeast Asian markets, but has not proved popular in the UK. So maybe Trendy Beat is a way to be like, well, what if we sold just stuff in a different way. Uh, shopping on social media is popular. Yonap News reports that YouTube is going to launch a shopping channel of its own in South Korea on June 30th, and that will offer live streamed shopping content with 30 brands signed up to go with it at launch. Discord Group Product Manager Derek Yang announced the platform plans to experiment with letting servers sell digital products, digital products, as one-time purchases over the coming months. So these products will be available in a new server shop section. The company is also updating its server subscription options, providing tier templates to make it easier to initially set up some support levels. Apple added support for pass keys to the betas of iOS 17, iPad OS 17, and macOS Sonoma. So if you're running the beta, you can use pass keys now to sign into any account linked to an Apple ID. And that includes your third party Apple ID sign-ins if you're using the Apple ID to sign into a third party site. So it doesn't have to be an Apple owned service, but you do have to be using an Apple device. This is not gonna work on your Windows machine, even if you're logging into something with an Apple ID. The Verge's West Davis, though, expects that support across devices would happen once the feature is fully released. DP review fans rejoice. Hopefully, publisher Gear Patrol announced it is saving by way of acquiring DP review around three months after the camera review site announced it was being shut down by Amazon. Amazon acquired DP Review back in 2007. So wait, why the hopefully? Are you are you doubtful that Gear Patrol is going to keep its word? I'm just saying, I know there are a lot of fans of DP They've Review saying, yay, before. it yeah. does not die after all. So let's hope it, you know, it thrives and it's, yeah. uh, it, uh, under its new ownership. In all right. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission filed a lawsuit against Amazon, alleging the company violated rules by using so-called dark patterns. Dark patterns is that practice of kind of trying to trick you into answering a same way because you're not paying close attention. Like you design the page to make the yes button bright blue with big letters and the no buttons kind of gray and small letters. So you're you're not going to pay attention to it as easily. But the main complaints of the FTC lawsuit are that non-prime subscribers saw multiple buttons for checkout. That would be where the dark patterns played in, uh, making it hard to see which one would not subscribe them to prime. Uh, in other words, there was one they had to pay close attention to to not accidentally sign up for prime. Uh, also, once they were tricked into signing up for prime, cancellation was too complicated, according to the FTC, making customers go through unnecessary steps. Amazon allegedly calls the prices Iliad internally, at least according to this lawsuit. Um, 
Iliad is a reference to the work by Homer about the Trojan War. I would have thought Odyssey would have been a better Homeric reference there because, you know, big long making people on a big long travel, but Iliad apparently is what they used. The FTC is looking for a court order to force Amazon to change its practices and provide refunds to affected customers. We all agree dark patterns suck, but Scott, should they be against the law? Oh, that's a big jump, isn't it? Going from they're terrible to we should ban them in legal ways. But I don't know. I I worked for a company for a while and was in some meetings that felt downright devious because those meetings were all about how do we make it hard for people to cancel our service. And it was a web service. This is like 2004, 05, so it was early. But it was still this feeling of like, we're going to make it really easy for them to sign up and almost impossible for them to figure out how how to get out of here. And worst case is they'll have to email us finally, and then we'll be forced to get them out. But then we'll still ask them questions. So this thinking, I think, is still pervasive. And obviously, it exists in big, huge companies like Amazon, all the way down to small, uh, you know, smaller services and sites. In terms of the question, though, should it be illegal? I'm kind of tempted. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, I said, nah, it's fine. You know, we're all adults here. We can figure it out. I'm starting to think maybe there ought to be at the very least some regulations that people have to adhere to or they get fined. And I guess that would, you know, that would bring in legal status. Um, so yeah, I'm going to answer the question. Yes. I think to make them suck less, people shouldn't be, be allowed to do them, especially when there's money involved. There's no money involved. It's just like a, a dumb thing where you sign up to have an avatar made or something, whatever it is, fine, whatever. But if you've got monetary transaction going on and people are making it difficult for you to get out and are using skeevy methods to get you in, we probably ought to have some guidelines. Well, and the thing about Prime too is I've been an Amazon Prime member for, I can't even tell you how long. It's been <laughs> not since the beginning of Amazon, certainly, but uh, you know we're going on a decade. Um, the price has crawled up over the years. It's $140 a year. It used to be 99 you know, and each time it goes up, you know, $10 or so, I go, well, but it, it, it makes sense to me because I use Prime a lot. And over the course of any given year, I am saving money. But if I didn't use Amazon the way that I do use it, then that could be a little much, um, especially if I was like, you know, I'm not using it. And so this doesn't make sense for me. I'm going to go ahead and cancel. Now, uh, I, I've never tried to cancel Prime since I signed up for it. So I'm not a great person to ask about how hard this is. However, there are definitely times where I'm going to buy a product and I'm seeing like, here's the, you know, here's the Prime button to get it, you know, when two days shipping or that sort of thing, you know, or here's the, you know, the Prime way to get it in fewer boxes, you know, save the planet while you're doing this type thing. Or here's another option to do it another way. Now, as a non-Prime subscriber, if you're seeing all those same options and you're kind of like, I really just need toilet paper or, you know, whatever it is, I can see where this could be confusing. I don't think Amazon is going out of their way to be like, hey, here are the differences between your account that is non-Prime and a Prime account, which could benefit you going forward. So that's, I think, where, you know, a lot of this stuff comes in. Stoic Squirrel just said uh, in our chat room, I'm not one to defend Amazon, but when I canceled Prime, it was easy. Uh, so I I think that it's a it's bad policy to try to define a business practice in a law. So trying to define dark patterns in a way that people won't be able to get around them sounds like a recipe for ineffective legislation. What I support is something that they've done in Europe. I believe they've done it in the UK. It may or may not have become an actual law, but I know it was it was in the draft, which is if you sign up for a thing away, you have to provide cancellation in the same way. So if it's one click to sign up for the thing, it should be one click to to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. For example, in the in Europe, uh, they required Amazon to make Prime cancelable in two clicks. Uh, if I call to uh, to subscribe, I should call to unsubscribe. But if I sign up online, I shouldn't have to call to unsubscribe. And again, Amazon isn't making you call; they're not going that far. Uh, but that that's where I would go with the rules and the laws. When you start trying to say like, "Well, your dark pattern is too confusing," it becomes a fight over like, "Well, but what if we did two buttons? And what if we did this shade of yellow?" And yeah. and I'm not sure that that's the most effective way to approach. there's a there's a lot they can do in two clicks too i was just thinking about my exit from uh, adobe i finally am uh, not paying for any adobe services after years and years and years of doing it 
And they really just gave me one page when I said, I want to cancel. And the page said, hey, if you stick around, we'll give you this deal for so many months. Do you want to do that? And that was on the same page as it saying, no, I'm still canceling and I can hit that button right below it. I don't mind that. Right. I don't feel like I'm being misdirected. I yeah. don't feel like I'm being tricked. Of course, I'm just the being company told, wants hey. to retain your sir. You know, sure. You know, and they, prob you know, they probably they probably have numbers, money. Sarah, that say this many people have been retained because we did. Do this. You know how long I kept paying for Acrobat for this exact reason where I was like, yeah. oh, well, that was good. Thank you for the kickback. <laughs> I guess I'll stick around for another four months. Sure. Sure. I don't want to take you know, that And away for anybody from who's sort of like dark patterns, I don't know. Have I ever seen something like this? Anytime you get an email and it's like, oh, I don't want this. I want to unsubscribe. Sometimes that's pretty easy to see. Sometimes it's like in a weird font or it's barely legible or it seems to not appear at all. You know, it's all sort of the same thing. It's a company yeah. saying, OK, we're providing the service, but we don't want you to do it. So we're going to look, it look for an uns possible. Yeah. Look for an unsubscribe uh, in an email that that'll help you understand dark patterns. So at least the, the first step. Well, what do we got next, Sarah? Well, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Electronic Arts CEO Andrew Wilson announced that the company will restructure its studios, as far as naming goes anyway, citing an effort to empower our creative team. So this includes splitting up EA Sports and EA Games into separate units, with the latter, EA Games, renamed to EA Entertainment. This will see COO, Chief Operating Officer, Laura Meal, as president of EA Entertainment, and Cam Weber remaining the head of EA Sports. Now, Scott, EA renaming games to entertainment sort of sounds like EA's got plans to expand. Where do you think that might go? Well, it's an interesting question, right? I, I, I have my own feelings about why sports should be separate and maybe should have been separate for years given the business that that represents because it's a very complicated license based thing and you're always you know negotiating for a better deal from the nfl for this year and are we going to continue getting the madden license or not and all this sort of stuff um aside from that though maybe this is an opportunity for them on the quote unquote now games side or what was game side now entertainment side to do more with their ips they have a number of them that are popular and that have been around for a long time, Mass Effect, Dead Space, uh, the, the list goes on. And they also do some Star Wars games. They no longer have exclusivity, exclusivity on that. But maybe this is a chance for them to say, we want to make, uh, we want to make a deal with Hulu and make a, a Dead Space series. Uh, it'll be a horror anthology series, and we're really excited about it. It'll be part of our EA Entertainment brand. Uh, games will still come out of there, but they'll be closely associated with these other projects, um, like. The way I'm saying it is the kind of spin I could expect. Yeah. And I, I don't mean that to say that it's just spin. It very well could be a great way for them to branch out. But um, they haven't really done any of this up till now. There hasn't been, in the way that you see from other, uh, other IP holders, um, you see more of this sort of stuff from Konami and Riot Games with their recent success with Arcane and uh, various others. The new Mario movie is an example of a big one from Nintendo after being kind of quiet on that front for a while. So I do think there's a a desire from gaming uh, juggernauts out there, EA being one of them, whether we like it or not, uh, who want to do more of this and end up with more hands in more cookie jars. And those cookie jars are other kinds and forms of entertainment that they're not necessarily suited to do internally, by the way. They're not going to make their own Dead Space television show. They will likely Yet. sub that out like Nintendo did with Imagine Entertainment or like uh, this Konami did with um, with Castlevania and whoever they worked with. They don't do these things internally, but they do a lot more of this now. And I think this is an opportunity for them to do that. Hold on, Scott. I'm on the phone with five year ago, Scott Johnson, who's telling me, well, Netflix isn't going to make games. They're just going to license their properties to games. Oh, I remember that Scott Johnson. Do, Tell you, him while he's think, there. do you think there's... <laughs> There's a possibility that, yes, not today, no, they're absolutely not going to make TV shows. But is this laying the groundwork of like, well, future streaming, maybe we need to keep that uh, that door open? Uh, entirely possible, I suppose. The, the problem with doing your own homegrown entertainment, you know, like Blizzard Entertainment is known for having the best internal animation cinematic studio in the business. Like there's no question. Uh, and most other uh, companies, they sub out this stuff to companies that are suited more to that full-time but blizzard has their own so they kind of farm their own stuff internally but 
They've never turned around and made a television show out of it or even a one-off film out of it. It's all aimed toward the games. So I'm not saying they're not doing that because uh, it's hard. I just think they're not doing it because it's a separate business. And so this could be them saying, well, by by branching out this way, now we have a separate business, kind of. Yeah. The problem is they're not splitting games from that. This isn't a whole new third leg. This is still part of the second leg, uh, well, sports being part of the first leg. So, so it doesn't sound like that's what they're ready to do. But I, you know, tell Scott mm. five years ago, A, quit eating fat food. And secondly, yeah. uh, he's he might be wrong about this. Who knows? Yeah, he said quit eating the fat food. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Too late. <laughs> Wayne, it didn't change immediately, so it must not have worked. <laughs> it didn't work. That was, that was bad reception. Uh. Uh, right, folks, we have fewer than 400 patrons to go to reach our goal. We're at 399. We can do it. We want to have 4,000 paid patrons by next Thursday. You can help us make that happen. And if we get there, Molly Wood has committed to being on the show the next day, June 30th, and once a month on Friday from then on. So help us make Molly Fridays happen. Patreon.com slash DTNS. The Metaverse may have arrived, but it's in Southeast Asia, and it's out in the world, not in a headset. Restofworld.org reports uh, the first example. We've got multiple examples, but the first example, Indonesia's TV1, biggest broadcast channel in the country, or at least one of the biggest, has been using a digital reporter called Nadira based on human news anchor Fahada Indi. Indy still provides the voice, but the machine model provides the visuals and the movements, as well as translations, here's the key, into British and American accented English, so two different accents, Chinese, and many local dialects, of which Indonesia has many, uh, including Javanese and Sundanese. There are two other avatars, too. Sasya is an imposing-looking Chinese-Indonesian avatar, and Bumi is a curly-haired Eastern Indonesian. This is uh, fascinating to me, and Indonesia uh, being where this is, uh, you know, taking place and seems to be thriving um, of particular interest uh, because a lot of people live in Indonesia, a series of islands, lots of different dialects, and the idea that um, a, you know, <laughs> I don't know, uh, you know, how popular Fahada India is, but let's just say pretty popular, right? News anchor, you know, you know. Be, People like her. People like her voice. People like her to uh, to give the news. Um, not everybody in Indonesia is going to want the news uh, or be able to even absorb the news translated in one way. A human trying to uh, figure out how to deliver news uh, with uh, you know a population of folks who are you know in the hundreds of you know dialects that would be an impossible task. You know, so you'd have to leave a lot of people out um, for this to be able to reach more people. Um, and as far as uh, as far as I know, this is something that Indonesia has been experimenting with uh, for uh, in, in a variety of ways. Airports, for example, uh, certain banks, that kind of thing um, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it doesn't you know, this is a situation where I can't I can't possibly say, well, you know, you're putting people out of jobs. In, in a way, you're, you know, being able to keep somebody in a job um, to be able to reach more folks. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that this is in Indonesia, isn't it? Uh, the immigration office at the airport, as you just mentioned, has four virtual spokespeople. And, and like you said, there's a bank, there's an Indonesian folk singer who's virtual with real life endorsement deals. Um why why so popular in Indonesia in particular? I know Indonesia is a center of of tech startups uh, and tech life, and they've tried to position themselves as a great place for companies to pivot to as they start to try to find new areas of the world to diversify supply chains and that. Maybe, maybe that's why, because there's just a, a culture of, of trying things. I don't know. It feels like this is where this stuff will will often start um, as we move forward into these metaverse like things or AI driven things. And the reason I think that is mainly I'm, I'm criticizing ourselves. I think we're a little re hesitant to do this. I think we're hesitant to see an avatar on the nightly news. When you say we, you mean the U.S. Americans? I'd say the mm -hmm. Americans. Yeah, I think we'd look I, I think at you know some truth to that. Yeah. We, we look at we look at some avatar on the nightly news telling us what's going on or what we should be hearing about or thinking. And we 
I think we balk at that. And I think that can change. I like a lot of things have, um, but I don't think it's going to come within. We're going to get super stoked here in pockets about it. We're going to get really excited about what it could mean, but as a mainstream acceptable method of disseminating news in multiple accents, markets, languages, um, I think we're going to be slow to embrace it uh, the way that other markets could. And by them embracing it, I think that will help us get around to it. Um, I hate that we're slow with this stuff because actually I'm kind of a fan well, of this aspect of the metaverse. I think it's cool. Respectfully, U.S. isn't the only market. Why isn't this happening in Europe? Why isn't it happening in India? Why isn't well, it happening in South Korea, Japan? Same like, same problem to, to some degree, right? Like they're we're all a little slow to do it. I would even argue Indonesia is just slow to do it. They're just going to be the first one. They're going to be the least slow to do it. Maybe. Um, I, I don't know that it will catch on like wildfire either. And it may take time to suss out what people actually really want. Personally, I'm stoked about it. I think about, you know, a, a game like Mass Effect where I walk into a space and and a, and a holographic robot lady tells me everything I need to know. And I tell her where I need to go and what I need to do. And they, uh, there's interactivity there. And and more beyond just consuming the, what she's saying, I can ask questions and get all I need. I'm for this future. I'm stoked about it. But I am too. I, I, don't, too. I, don't, I don't know a lot of people want to sit down and watch, you know, NBC Nightly News with a with a fake dude yet. Yeah, but at the same time. OK, so I was thinking about this earlier. It's like, OK. So let's say I call my bank and I've got to go through some phone tree thing, right? Um, you know, I live in California, so there's, you know, a lot of Spanish that's spoken in California is, is, as well as English. Um, you know, so there's always like, you know, if you want the rest in Spanish, you know, press two type thing. So it's like, uh, there's, I'm, I'm used to this in, in, in some respects, but yes, if I'm watching my nightly news, you know, and Tom Brokaw is telling me what's going on and I'm like, yeah, well, but I don't I don't speak English. So I would like Tom Brokaw, you know, trusted name and news to be able to speak to me in a way that feels a little bit more seamless, a little bit more like I'm being heard, I'm being reached. I think that is an awesome thing. Now, I know we're you know, the U.S. is, <laughs> you know, we're we can be pretty insular about a lot of things, um, you know, and, and I live here. So, you know, <laughs> I feel like I can say that only speaking for myself, but, you know. Some of you as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, a, a country like Indonesia, I think, is uh, so much more of a melting pot of culture, of language, of, um, you know, you know, you are pretty close to going to lots of other countries just geographically. Um, you know, the official language, uh, which is based on Malay, I was reading up about this this morning because it's very fascinating, is actually not the most spoken language, just the official language. Um, so when you when you have all that stuff, plus a country of, you know, 200 plus million people in a relatively small space, I think it's fascinating uh, that this is happening and it's also working. And that that makes me think uh, that India would be the next on the docket Absolutely. for something like this, 100%. right? Because same yeah. thing, huge population with a large number of languages. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know what, if you're in the audience in India right now and you're like, oh no, we already have it, please send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Well, I don't know how hungry everybody is um, mm. after this conversation uh, about the metaverse being a real thing, but I am. So I would like to let you know that you can drop a pin and get a pizza. That is, if you like Domino's Pizza, because the company announced pinpoint delivery. This is designed to be able to get a pizza delivered to a specific location, but not necessarily a specific address. You might not be home. You might be at the beach. Maybe you're having a picnic in the park. Maybe you're on a street corner. I don't care. You might just want to eat some pizza. So Domino's is using Google Maps in its mobile app, its own mobile app, to receive your order. You drop a pin. Then you can trap your uh, <laughs> trap your driver and also track your driver's GPS location. And then you can get text updates and arrival times about you know when they're arriving. Now, if you're saying this is magical, there are some restrictions. You can't like have the driver wade out into the ocean and give you a pizza <laughs> type of hey, thing. Hey, get a speedboat driver. Come it on. Need, <laughs> it needs to be at a reasonable and safe spot for a driver to pull over. And then you only have four minutes to meet them. So if you're giving them, you know, a little bit of a curveball, just know that it might not work out. But hey, if you want to play, pizza is pizza. 
We are uh, preparing for a trip uh, in in the end of August, beginning of September, and we've been watching these videos about picnicking by the Han River in Seoul. Mm. And one of the things that is normal there is to get delivery. Like you go rent your picnic equipment, you uh, go to the convenience store, get your drinks, and then you order like fried chicken or something to be delivered. And there's like a space dedicated for delivery people that you have to go meet. Uh, this turns that into anywhere in the world. Well, anywhere Domino's is operating, I guess, uh, for pizza. Like it doesn't have to be a specific area that has been set up and organized. You can just have your pizza, whatever park, beach, wherever you are. I think exactly. that's pretty cool. Yeah, no. And Domino's is, is, is quick to say in its announcement, it's like, listen, if you're backpacking in some backcountry area that Domino's would never deliver to. Like, don't expect somebody to like magically find you. Like they're not going to like, you know, like parachute a, down, <laughs> you know, it's not, that's Repel not going to happen. into a ravine. Yeah. But yeah, like Yet. you might just be like, well, I'm not home, but I'm not at a friend's house either. We're kind of in transit and wouldn't that be fun? This is a this is another option, and Domino's, the, you know, gotta the, give this, you kudos to, to. That's what the drones are for. Eventually, the drone delivered pizza will be able to use this to go anywhere. We're just not there yet. That's all. Exactly. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. We got some really good feedback on our Fediverse conversation from Tuesday's show with Patrick Norton. Doug wrote in saying Meta joins the joining the Fediverse uh, in a is in a big way and stays there long enough to have some traction. If they then decide to block some other Mastodon operators, though, they have outsized impact in terms of the number of users that removes them from the site. And because of human inertia, that means that most of those users won't quickly switch over. Doug says open systems are good. What are better are open systems with rough operational parity in terms of size and impact. Um, Katie wrote in with a somewhat similar sentiment. She wrote into our Patreon saying, I think my main concern with Meta and the Fediverse is that the Fediverse was some place that a lot of marginalized people sought out to be a safe haven from places like Twitter and Facebook. The other concern I have is the ability of a company like Meta to have a greater influence on protocols like ActivityPub to change them to be more Facebook Meta friendly. Yeah, these are these are both great points. Uh, what I, what I would say to Doug and Katie is, you know, the hope is that the open protocol is designed to prevent the abuses that Doug and Katie are worried about. Katie's point about uh, Meta getting influence over the Activity Pub protocol uh, is another spin on that. But again, if you have a properly functioning, properly governed uh, set of rules for Activity Pub, they shouldn't be able to have undue influence for them. All these concerns are, are totally valid, though. Uh, and and thanks to Katie and Doug for sharing them with us. Indeed. Uh, Tom, a.k.a. Kaji Kemper, wanted to follow up on our GDI discussion about Samsung's forthcoming 49-inch Odyssey monitor and linked us to an article from How To Geek called Your Gaming Monitor Might Be Too Big. Uh, Scott, this, this How To Geek article says that issues like lower pixel density in a large monitor, strained reactions because it's so big, ergonomic stress, hidden costs contribute to diminishing returns as screen size increases. For optimum gameplay comfort and budget balance, smaller monitors often prove more beneficial, says How to Geek. I 100% be too big? I 100% agree with this. I had an experience that I will now share with you, which is this. I thought it would be cool to have a 46-inch uh, 4K television as a computer monitor. I thought that would be the coolest way to play. I could play in 4K, HDR, all the fancy bells and whistles, and do it right from my computer. Here's what happened. I would miss all kinds of special peripheral UI elements. <laughs> it would be like, I'm going, now where's that supposed to be? I don't see it. Well, way over here, if I'd have just stood back and looked up to the left, I would have seen the tiny corner up here where some very valuable UI information is telling me exactly what I need and where I need to go. Um, it became a problem. Like I actually noticed it a lot where I was just forgetting to look at the rest of it. I became very, very not, not tunnel vision, but very narrow focused on what was right in front of me, depending on the game. And it really threw me. So I went back to a 32 and it solved it. And my wife got a television in the bedroom. So now that's there. Uh, but it, but, but it solved the problem. I don't have this problem anymore. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that if I even went smaller, I'd benefit more. 27 feels like the happy place for most gamers. Um, but we do have this thing going where they get cheaper, they get bigger. And we all think we want bigger all the time. I think there's 
I think there is an upper limit on that with gaming monitors. So I completely agree uh, about this. This article is, is correct as far as I'm concerned. Everyone's going to be a little bit different. You might just be fine with your gigantic screen. But I don't. It didn't work for me. It made me feel kind of dumb, if I'm honest. I didn't like it. Um, well, we never feel dumb when you're on the show, Scott Johnson. Not a once. Bring oh, good. The knowledge. Knowledge with a big OK. Uh, <laughs> let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Sounds great. Today, Nintendo did one of their directs and dropped a couple of big, un, uh, previous to today, unheard of bombs we didn't know they were going to do. Do you want to know what those were? Do you want to hear us disseminate what those were, why they matter, and why the Switch might have one of the better uh, falls for all the major consoles? Tune in to our podcast called Core. It's all about video games, and it happens every Thursday, uh, Thursday night. If you want the podcast, find it wherever you get podcasts. Just search for Core. And for all other details, check us out, uh, both live or otherwise, at frogpants.com slash core. If you have just around a dollar a week to spare, like that's you can't even get a cup of coffee for that. You can become a patron. And when you do, you there's no downside. You're getting extra content. You're getting the Discord. You're getting access to all of us. And you get to stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, where we're going to talk about AI's role in the new Marvel series, Secret Invasion. It has ruffled a few feathers by trying to stay on brand with the theme of the show. How dare they? <laughs> but just a reminder, DTNS is live, and you can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back. Doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>